welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, series, and more. And this is episode two of Fourth Wing, where we are covering chapters five through ten. Like every other episode, we do have a content warning. Fantasy Fangirls Podcast is rated R, like the book Fourth Wing. Look, we get some delicious Zayden and Violet banter here. And while we're not quite into our full-blown R rating yet, the tension is building. And we absolutely are going to be talking spoilers. Everything from Fourth Wing, speculations for Iron Iron Flame, the new excerpt that just came out. Make sure you watch that bonus podcast episode. And anything else from Rebecca Yaros is on the table. So if you don't know why Jack Barlow saying, I want the black dragon is sweet irony. Stop listening now and go to the audiobook. Instead, we will still be here when you're done. And now it's time to start scaling trees in the dead of night to poison our sparring enemies. Let's dive into these delicious chapters. Before we begin our analysis of the stretch of chapters, we're going to start, like always, with the battle brief, aka our summary of what happens in chapters 5 through 10. Take it away, Nicole. Chapter 5. We begin in battle brief. And trying to keep herself under the radar, Violet tells her new friend Rhiannon to ask a very specific question about the elevation of the battle they're dissecting. But it fails spectacularly. The teacher knows Violet is the one asking these highly intelligent questions. But as they're explaining this battle, we learn that the wards around Navarre that allows it so only dragon magic can be used within the wards are faltering. Dun, dun, dun. And it's not <gasps> the first time. Dun, dun, dun. We learn, thanks to smart boy Zayden over here, that the villages were ransacked, which means the griffins are looking for something. Later that day, it's time for sparring assessments, and an intimidated Violet looks in horror as Jack fucking Barlow literally snaps the neck of a sparring partner, killing him instantly. Jesus. It's Violet's turn and she faces off against second year, half-shaven, pink-haired, badass, rebellion-wearing relic Imogen, and she gets her ass completely kicked. Her shoulder gets dislocated and she breaks her arm. Sucks to be Violet right now. Chapter six, to the healer's quadrant away. Dane carries a very injured Violet to the healer's quadrant and finds head healer Winifred and her husband, a writer whose signet is mending, Nolan, who quickly work to fix Violet up, something they're very used to doing over the past five years. But Dane the stain is being the worst kind of scum and begs them not to heal her her and instead leave her injured so she would be taken pity on and sent to the scribes that is a major l our guy dane just took. Oh, wow. this is when i was really like oh geez dane i can't root for you dude violet drinks the best guy's version of morphine and starts slurring like she's had one too many tequila shots we've all been there girl after getting mended up much to dane's dismay violet goes back to her barracks but what's that underneath violet's pillow she finds a gift from mira is that brennan's declassified school survey survival guide? I think it is. Chapter 7. Poison Master Violet is out after curfew, grabbing the type of berry that she can use to hurt her next opponent on the mat. Thank you, Brennan, for telling her where to find out who her next target is. We love you. But as she's pulling her Mission Impossible, two cloaked figures arrive at the base of the tree. It's Satan and Imogen. Oh, shit. I was so scared when I first read this. I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is bad. As she starts to freak out, more and more figures start to come to the party. All have rebellion relics which is illegal according to the quadrant rules no more than three marked ones can gather at one time more on that later turns out it is mostly a harmless meeting where zayden is trying to help the first years in the most zayden i will not coddle you way but one of the first years asks when do we get to kill violet Soringale? rough. Zayden responds with, she's mine to handle. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> they dissolve the meeting and after she's sure the coast is clear, Violet climbs down the tree and shadows come out to grab her and the next thing she knows, she's at Dagger Point by Zayden Ryerson. Uh -oh. Yeah, she is. Oh, so we had two very We're different totally different. <laughs> We learn that Zayden is very powerful and a very rare shadow wielder. He asks if Violet plans to tell anyone, mainly her mother or Dane, about the rebellion meetup and Violet says she won't because they weren't really doing anything wrong. Surprised, Zayden says he owes her a favor and leaves. Chapter 8. Dane walks Violet to breakfast duty, the position she chose so that she can poison her sparring opponents. Our girl is smart. Yet again, Dane begs her to go to the squad quadrant, and when she finally denies him, 
again. He says, lay low when it comes to Jack Barlow, completely at odds with Satan's throw some daggers at him approach. At Dragon Class, yes, that is the technical name, we learn the amount of dragons wanting to bond this year and every year are dwindling. Fewer and fewer dragons are refusing to bond. Cue mystery noise here. We learn that there is an unbonded black dragon with a morning star tail, and he is one of the most powerful and rare dragons, just like General Melgan's. Alarm oh. alert, alarm alert. Like he is calling shotgun, Jack Barlow calls dibs on said black dragon. But Because that's how it works, right? With Professor Kaor, we get a huge download laced with foreshadowing about the black dragon's previous writer and that they attempted to resurrect Brennan unsuccessfully, major air quotes, at sparring. Violet prepares for her first challenge and ass wipe Jack taunts her even more. She takes a leaf out of Zayden's book, though, and throws two daggers at him, shutting him up instantly and pissing Dane off. Two things we love. <laughs> she faces Orin Seifert, who definitely tries to kill her, and she wins. She also faces her next five challenges over the next five weeks, thanks to getting some poison maneuvering in, and she wins those as well. But good things don't always last long here at Bazgaeth. Her sixth challenger is taken to the infirmary early, and who steps in but Zayden Ryerson. Chapter nine, Zayden is good, really fucking good at the mat, and he's taking all of her daggers away. He starts actually instructing her, though, and being an ass while he's doing it, but at least one helpful ass. Later on, Violet's getting a massage to help ease her aching muscles. Oh, wait, it's from Dane. Boo. And after some dragon talk, yet again, Dane starts talking about how Violet should go to the scribes, mentioning how he's talked to one of the professors in the scribe quadrant, and they have agreed to take her. This pisses Violet off to no end, because even though this is her way out, she won't take it. Damn it. Chapter 10, last of this section. It is time for America Ninja Warrior. Oh, wait, it's actually the gauntlet. And this thing is intimidating as fuck. For the next two and a half weeks, their task is to practice getting up the gauntlet that preps them for all things dragon. On Violet's turn to run up the gauntlet, our favorite Ravenclaw begins listing facts about feather tail dragons doo -doo 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 -doo, and other dragon types to calm her understandably pounding heart rate down. While she doesn't make it the last little bit, Violet does better than we think. Orally, however, a fellow squad mate wasn't so lucky. No! She decides to go to the burn pit to burn Orly's pack, and Violet begins to unravel. It's time to choose scribes or riders. And who should join but recently back from a late night flying session, Zayden fucking Ryerson. And she's not in the fucking mood. She tells him to make up his mind on if he's going to kill her or not. And then after a better pep talk than he gave the first years under the tree, he tells Violet the right way isn't the only way to get up the gauntlet. And he walks away. Ooh, all right. Good job, Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> I got a theater degree. <laughs> so now that we know exactly what happened in chapters five through 10, we are going to tap into our signet power and start diving into key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and theories. Well, because right off the bat, I noticed we had an error in episode one and I want to correct it. So when we were talking about representation in the novels, we said that there was a character who has they, them pronouns and is nameless. They are not nameless. That is not true. Their name is Heaton and they are a third year in Violet's squad. We're not perfect. We're going to have mistakes, but as we see these, we're going to call them out and correct them in later episodes. Okay. Let's talk about the chapter five opening because this of all the openings in this stretch is highly notable and I'm going to read it word for word knowing that I'm in direct disagreement with General Melgren's orders I am officially objecting to the plan set forth in today's briefing it is not this general's opinion that the children of rebellion leaders should be forced to witness their parents execution no child should watch their parent be put to death this is by none other than our girl Lilith Sorengale what are your thoughts on this I want to first put some emphasis on the should be forced to witness because there is a difference of being forced to witness and choosing to witness it and that is something that Liam did and I assume a lot of the other especially older kids did and I think that you know they choosing to witness their parents execution as absolutely horrible and terrifying and traumatizing as it is it's a way for them to show up for their parents that they love and yeah. to be there for them in a really terrible terrible moment so while I think that General Sorengel's way of not forcing them to watch it, she's still executing their parents. So if Lilith is bad, like let's just go down the line that she's not a Snape character. She is capital B bad. And she did kill Violet's dad. 
it is kind of sweetly ironic that Violet had to watch her dad wither away. Mm. And here it is, should be forced to witness with Children of the Rebellion. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, don't know, I just thought that was a cool tidbit. Now let's think about if she is a Snape character. I think we're talking here pretty baseline empathy here like let's not make children watch their parents be executed i think that this passage is a nice little reflection on her character whether she is either good or bad it shows that she has somewhat of a heart a little little bit Uh, it it does and i think that that's very purposeful we're working on episode three outline right now and it's like we're going into threshing and as like she has no fucks to give towards Violet at threshing, at least on the outside. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm really torn on the, is Lilith good or bad? Is she undercover? Does she know Brennan's? I think she knows Brennan's alive, but I don't, I do. I don't know Uh, why. I just, something in my gut says, I think she does know. I, I'm going to go with she doesn't. Are we adding this to the list? (laughs) We might have to add this to the list. Our, our list of how we disagree on certain theories and predictions. And we're making a list and we're going to figure out like some bets. And once we start reading Iron Flame, we'll see how all of that plays out. Anyway, we will keep you all updated. Every single time she is mentioned, we are absolutely going to be talking about it because I think her character is extremely interesting. And I think that there is going to be some Snape, like there is going to be some kind of redemption arc, but it's going to be kind of like how, where's our starting line, right? Is she starting as a bad guy or is she starting as, hey, she technically already had her redemption arc. We just didn't know about it yet. Right. So it's, it's where, where in that redemption arc are we at this time? We just don't know yet. Now here's another thing. She might not have killed her husband, but maybe other generals or other leadership did. And she like, hushed it up so that Violet and Mira wouldn't like lash out because they both could I, but maybe she's working on the inside to get maybe I don't know. I, I I'm just making shit up at this point I feel like I, I, I think she definitely knows that her husband was did not die of natural causes yeah like he, he he was killed it was a targeted kill and she knows that and she is protecting Violet we talked about that in episode one I'm gonna definitely yeah. stick to that and I think that even just that little context even if there's nothing else that she is just who she is but she just wants her daughter to to have a chance at survival which she ironically wouldn't in scribes I think that this is just again just kind of building up her character a little bit in yeah. really unique ways from a unique lens in this book right let's move on so, to battle brief i i just i love it when 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 our characters are in classes like i always Same. loved it in harry potter <laughs> i like, think it's, it's a harry just, potter thing <laughs> right it, it's just like that like childhood and grade yeah so more and more examples of teachers specifically professor markham of the scribes are looking at pilot like she's already going to die like the, you know like in in episode one someone had been talk was literally talking to her in the past tense like that is how certain they are that she is going to die yes and it's also really reinforcing how big of a deal this is that she is in the writer's quadrant again like like we needed any more emphasis on this this is the last place anyone expected her to be and showing once again her mom's control and in many opinions lack of opinions in the book lack of good judgment because she's forcing this daughter of hers into the writer's quadrant when she technically shouldn't be in there but the irony here of her professors genuinely doubting her is that she of course ends up bonding with two dragons and she she has a lot of potential with her power when it comes to her signet and one of her dragons is like one of the biggest badassest dragons there are literally in the world here yeah so just some really fun irony and a ha 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 i'm gonna prove you wrong that she doesn't know it yet but we do so we're cheering you on girl so we also get a major wards download in this section and we learn that the dragons aren't the only creatures capable of channeling powers to their writers so so griffins from poor emile they also share this channeling power ability but dragons are more powerful than the griffins and they are the only ones who can channel magic with it within the Navarian borders because of all of these very strong wards that they have all put up. That means within the wards, only dragon magic is possible, not griffin magic, which gives them a huge advantage in these confrontations. So that's why it's such a big deal that these wards are breaking because it gives the griffins the opportunity to come in when that opportunity should not be there in the first place. Do you think that Mira was the one who sensed it? I don't know if that's where her... I can't remember the, the place where this battle was. Like, it's super connected, signet-wise, to the wards. Like, was she and Tiny the one who sensed it? 
Wouldn't that be interesting? I feel like Violet knows where her sister is located. And she no, she doesn't have... though, because remember they they went to that outpost, and she was like, "You're <gasps> right, Mira, you're here, you're right." Oh, I wonder. It it was a dragon that sensed it, not a rider though. So if I want, I wonder if it was tiny though. Oh, but if it was a dragon who sensed it, I don't know. Is tiny connected to the wards? Maybe. I think that's her unique power because the dragon's so. power is different, but it helps manifest it. So yeah. I think that's a good question. I think that also just like the idea that a dragon since the wards failing was also kind of a surprisingly a big deal. Something else that really stands out during Battle Brief, especially on a reread, is Violet understandably has so much trust in the system. You know, her mom's a general. She it has been ingrained in her for her entire life that Navarre equals good, that they are the good guy. She believes that they are getting the full, even if it's somewhat redacted, knowledge of what they'll be up against out on the battlefield. When in in reality it is so much worse than any of them could even imagine now i am curious if the professors that are teaching these classes are fully aware of the venom of all of the other dangers that are threatening their world i, I don't know about that i don't think anyway. they are right so oh. so then so somebody's redacting oh. it we can assume that general Stormgale does know about it because of the weapon that she has so the professors they really emphasize the accurate depiction of the front lines reliable information is important to make these strategic decisions the importance of documenting history for the good of future generations everyone none of this is true like we learn at the very end of this book that everything that we're hearing right now is not true and again, we don't know if the professors think that it's true or they just straight out lying. The professors are saying how important it is to prepare these cadets and these writers for Beyond the Borders, but they're not actually doing this. So here's a question. Is this a reason the dragons don't want to bond as much? We've talked quite a few times about how the dr dragons are getting increasingly more frustrated and let's just say pissed off at the writer's quadrant and how they're going about doing things. What if this is one of those things? Because the humans, they're not ready for what's ahead because leadership is keeping them in the dark and consequently they're setting up these writers and subsequently their dragons up for failure. I am 100% in this camp. Like you dove. I just dove into this camp with you. Well, and also like, I think I mentioned this in the bonus episode and I'm going to mention it again in, in episode three. So I won't get too into it, but like during presentation, the whole, like they're talking about Venon, Luca is immediately like, that's stupid. She gets roasted in the next two yes. pages. Like literally yes. I, I, I feel, and uh, I feel like that's just way too obvious because there's a reason that less and less of them are bonding. Exactly. Yep. There is absolutely a reason. I am, I believe that this is one of them, that the humans are not setting up their future generations for success. And the dragons are the ones who are really paying for it. Mm. I have so much to say about that, but I'm going to wait until thrushing when we cover thrushing in the next episode. All right. I do have one quick thing about Devera. She gives me mad hot McGonagall vibes. I can see that. Like, I, I don't know what it that. is. She just, to me, I have painted her as the Professor McGonagall of the Writer's Quadrant. I hope she stays good like McGonagall does. I don't think that's going to happen. I, well, I, I, what do you think? Do you think Devera knows about the Venom? I'm just going to throw out and say no. There is no real mm. rhyme or reason to that. I'm just, my heart is telling me no. I, I, I truly don't know. I'm, I'm super on the fence on that one. So there is this one quote that I want to pull from Battle Brief that really stood out to me. And it says, I swear I can feel him staring at the, this is him meaning Dane. I swear I can feel him staring at the back of my neck from seven rows behind me. I'm not going to turn around and look. Not when I know Zayden is somewhere up there too. I think it's really interesting that whenever Zayden walks into a room, she gets like that prickle. We'll talk more about that in a second. But like she gets that prickle. She She's like, I know Zayden's here. I know Zayden's here. I don't know. Something about this, like, even though she says, I swear I can feel him staring at me, there's just like something about it where it's like, it's not as certain as whenever Zayden's in the room. So like, there's so many scalp prickling moments. And on my second reread, I didn't really think twice because I was like, oh, they're all after she bonds. Wrong. They're not. There's a lot of scalp prickling moments that happen before they start bonding like I mean the first one I think is literally on the parapet it doesn't say scalp prickling per se but there is like something where she's like there's like a twinge at the back of my neck or maybe the, the hairs on my neck stand up that's yep. it but 
literally throughout this entire stretch of chapters, my scalp prickles, the there's no ignoring the prickle on my scalp and the, the hairs on my neck rise like over and over and over again. Now, there's a lot to say about Zayden being an intrinsic and this is him like reading her mind. This could be like the 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 talons caressing her mental shields version of fourth wing like obviously that's an akatar reference but like that could be this version of maybe they have like that bond but also this could be just every time his shadows notice her i don't know there's so many options but i'm curious of those three it's either this is just their bond which could open up a faded mates conversation which i have a lot to say about that it could be zayden's an intrinsic or this could be this is just every time his shadows notice her i'm gonna go with door number three i I'm not sold on the Zayden is an intrinsic yet, yet, but this is definitely the most biggest proof point that supports this theory for sure. There is absolutely I have a something- big point. I have a big point in next episode that I am. Like, I read it and I was like, I'm convinced. <laughs> like, I'm convinced. That's the teaser. I'm not going to say what it is, but I, I might convince you next episode. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm looking forward to that showdown. I think that this such a chapter is where it really starts becoming from just like a description about when he's around to like, oh, this is like very reoccurring. There is a pattern here and there is something absolutely to it. I'm like, I'm torn between... Zayden's an intrinsic because also someone someone on what was it which social media platform was it? So, someone one of our followers you guys we have had an insane last 24 30 46 I don't even know how many hours like I'm so sorry I you guys have been sending us so many theories I'm gonna get confused on which ones you guys who sent which but someone sent me a theory that was like all of the marked ones all the rebel kids have two signet powers because Imogen's like super fast and they sh- she shows that on the mat and then she also has like wiping memories what if this is Zayden's second being an intrinsic but he just like hit it really well if we're gonna talk about Imogen's second power his speed is considered one of the lesser powers so I am oh, okay. going to respectfully disagree with that particular instance now do I think that there is something to the rebellion relics having giving them extra whether it's powers or th- there's something more to the magic of these tattoos and w- which we already know about because if more than three of them are together then General Melgren can't see the outcome so there is absolutely yeah. magic tied into this is it big of a magic I I don't think so because General Melgren's Black Dragon gave it to them as a punishment versus Mm -hmm. I don't think that a dragon would accidentally give that kind of power. But somebody's an intrinsic. Somebody is. Someone is. It's either Zayden or someone else in the rebellion. Like I am absolutely capital C convinced. I just wanted to point out like the the amount of times that we get the scalp prickling before they even are bonded through dragons is absolutely insane. Now there's also a moment in Battle Brief where Devera basically mentions something along the lines of people have been called into service before graduation and Violet says like it sounds like we're going to be called into service before we're third years do you think it's going to be iron flame whoa oh what if the end of iron flame is them all being called into service at the end of their second year so she's not even going to have a third year and this is a De- deathly hallow situation i i think that's very very possible i don't think she's going to have a third year or at least a traditional third year i don't because... think so either. <laughs> i i do think that that something's going to happen third year and she's going to be called into service now is she going to go into service for navarre or is she going to go into service for rebellion? Because that, to me, is an obvious answer. I feel like she's going to go into service for the rebellion. I don't know and if the, the wording would be go into service for them, but true. that she, yes, she would choose to, to fight to for that. that to fight. Yes. Now let's move on to the assessments, the sparring assessments, which are supposed yes. to be nice and easygoing. <laughs> They're not. Is anything nice and easy going at Bezgaev? Like, I don't, no. I don't think so. Who is it Riddick at one point who's just like, ah, oh, just one more thing. It's like, yeah. yeah, I think we can all channel our inner Riddick and just be like, oh my gosh. God, I love Riddick. <laughs> so one thing that really stood out to me in sparring is it drives me crazy that Dane is all for like females kicking guys' ass on the mat until Violet goes on. Like at one yep. point he's literally like, you know, he's like cheering uh Re. He's cheering another first year. I can't remember their names, but like he's just all for it. And then the second Violet stands on the mat, he's like, isn't she a little like, isn't they, aren't they a little out of their league? Like, it's just like, fuck you. And then when you read scenes like Jack breaking the other first year's neck, that again, it's just one more nail in the coffin about how dangerous this place is and just how brutal it is. But 
I, I really, I'll say like what the instructor does say, you know, he's a little bit sympathetic to them. He's like, yeah. you don't have to get used to it, but you do have to function through it. And as harsh as that is, I, I am not in the military. I, I have, that is not my career choice. However, I feel like that is a very military-esque thing to say yeah. where it's like, no, like don't get over it, but you still have to push through. You still got to get this job done. You still have to show up and essentially compartmentalize it. Anyway, and and then other little lines too that are kind of throwaway in the moment, but again, just really reinforce the the survive or die here. When Violet is passing the empty bunks of fellow cadets, and she honestly doesn't know if they're dead or off having sex. Like, no idea. I think I missed that line on my past few reads. Like, oh God, that just hit me in the gut. That's... You missed a sex Terror. reference, Nicole? I know. That's actually really surprising. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I read this book four times. Like, Jesus. Then we move on to the healer's quadrant because Imogen absolutely rips Violet a new one. Literally rips her shoulder open, basically. And Dane, just sweet damsel fucking in distress. Dane. Damn it. God, fucking damn it, Dane. We have an entire section devoted to that today, by the way. I can't wait. But Dane carries her off to the healers. But right at the top, it's it's noted that menders do not only have the power for mending people, but they also have the power to fix, restore, and return anything to its original state. And I totally miss that in the past few I reads. Too. So seeing that, it was like, oh, well, Brennan helped mend Arisha like literally this burnt city and Zayden at the end says like yeah we're like working on returning it to its previous state so that makes sense that Brennan is there for many reasons but also there to mend literally mend Arisha I will I will happily take any moment to to call out some Dane major L's literally wanting to keep her injured what the fuck yeah I will say this in Dane's defense, just like thinking really? about, no, just, just listen, because I don't agree with, with this whole sequence. I do not agree. Put yourself in Dane's shoes. Someone who he loves dearly is in this writer's quadrant, which we were just talking about there just a few moments ago about how dangerous it really is. And like he found, he's finding ways out for her and he's so frustrated that she's not taking them. And and, and all he wants to do is save her. Like, he's coming from this place of, oh, my God, like, I need to help you. You know, he's begging her at some points because it's going to be so torturous. Now, that's the extent of my sympathies for him because it's torturous for him, not mm-hmm. for her. And he's not mm-hmm. listening to her needs. And it's like, sorry, dude. Like, she's there's nothing you can do here. Like, thank you for trying, but let's move on. Anyway, I just – it, it would be really, really difficult being in his shoes and essentially feeling like your hands are tied when yeah. they're technically not because you are finding opportunities and nobody's listening to you. I totally see where you're coming from. And I never liked him from the beginning. He just gave me, like I said in the first episode, he gives me major Gale vibes and that's not a compliment. But this section is when I started hating him this particularly I love when Unif- Winifred is literally like make yourself useful boy it's, she's like speaking for an entire fandom right now and I love it you know I was just saying you know it, it just really shows his his selfishness right yeah. um it is he's he's coming from a place of love but not the kind of love that she needs and by the way Nolan is talking about the marked ones and how yeah. they have to go into the writer's quadrant. This is not the only time this is brought up before she talks to Liam and it's like this big reveal for her. I, I understand in this moment because I, I believe she's already drugged up when Nolan is talking and, you know, she, she's a little preoccupied even if she's not yes. yet. So I, I give her this pass. But again, how does Violet not know more about the marked ones? She She talks quite a lot about how she has read everything there is to know about the rebellion. I can guarantee you she has read the treaty. Guess what? This is included in the treaty. So I want to point out that Addendum 5.2 of the Biscayeth War College Code of Conduct states that no more than three cadets carrying rebellion relics may be assigned to any squad of any, listen to this, quadrant, any quadrant. Now, that is gives the impression that they're allowed to choose which quadrant they want to be part of. But later in the book, we see addendum 4.2 of the Treaty of Arisha says that they must be in the writer's quadrant. So what we can determine here is that the code of conduct says one thing, and then the Treaty of Arisha, which is fairly new, we, we go more into that in today's archive section, 
that is the writer's quadrant. I don't know. There's some inconsistencies there that I'm very curious about. Well, I wonder if the code of, well, we actually know, we know the code of conduct is fair play. Like everyone can see that because Violet quotes it like it's literally the Bible. But the addendum of the treaty, I don't think that's, is, is that common knowledge? Like do people just have the ability to like walk into the archives and see the Treaty of Arisha? That's my question. I would imagine then- so because Violet has read it, which again brings us back to the inconsistencies that she should know this information before Liam tells her because a lot of other people do, including Nolan. Because like our girl Violet, it is said so often, you're so smart. Like Zayden is wet for how smart she is. It's ridiculous. But it's more hard for him. But yes, <laughs> semantics. Having that, I I, um, I don't know. There, there are some moments where I'm like, girl, you're supposed to be intelligent. <laughs> like, come on, yes. you can do this. I do think she has blind spots because she's a human too. Now, I do want to point out in the healer's quadrant how well of a job the narrator does with like Violet slurring and just this whole section. The narrator on the audiobook gets a lot of flack. And I'm not going to say it's not deserved. There is some stretch of chapters where she is clearly congested whether it's from a cold or just really bad allergies it happens to the best of us but it is really distracting as a reader I I got to the point where I was like okay I can either obsess over this or just get past it so I just kind of leaned into the the second door there but I want to always give the narrator a mega amount of credit where credit is due because this is a really really tough book to narrate and she did an excellent job despite being sick and sniffling into the microphone a few times it's okay we'll look past it but I do want to just point out how well of a job she does in this scene Brennan's declassified Bezgaith's survival guide first off the bat is like why did Mira wait this long to give this to Violet why didn't she give it to her on conscription day I have a theory on that Mira was very concerned that Violet was going to die now she was giving her sister confidence and giving her the five minute okay here's everything you gotta do to survive and especially get past the parapet there mira's focus was on the parapet was packing her bag for her making sure she had the right shoes of course there was more to it after she passed through that but she was really focusing on we just got to make you from a candidate to a cadet here that is goal number one here i think she did not include brennan's survival guide because if violet had fallen god forbid that would have been lost as well and so she almost needed her sister to make it past that to I'm not going to say trust her with this very very valuable journal but but she needed to make sure that it was going to be in the right person's hands now yeah. obviously Violet could die at any point in the writer's quadrant we've learned that very clearly I didn't think about it as like if she died on the parapet it would be like gone forever like that I mean I guess well no because they can come and pick it up would be stuff. otherwise too so no not necessarily because they have two oh. options the families can either come and get their stuff and do their own burial or like or Lee's family later on in the stretch, uh, they don't. And literally teachers here are just like, okay, we'll just throw this in this giant incinerator, like heartless. So they would be, so Mira would be able to come and get her stuff. Um, true, true. I do. I love the inclusion of Brennan's declassified best guys survival guide, because it really primes us readers to a think of Brennan as a core part of the story, making his appearance at the end, just like chef's kiss magnificent b it also allows us to start learning more about him getting an idea of who he is how he thinks which makes it easier assuming we're going to be spending a lot of time with him in iron flame it lays a lot of the groundwork of character development at least like character verbiage and all that kind of stuff that that's already been done in book one because of this i absolutely agree with that and c it, sh- it really shows that there is someone looking out for her in a truly helpful way. We had that with Mira at the beginning, and we have that with her friends, Rihanna, who's helping her on the mat, right? But guess who's not helping her, Nicole? Fucking Dane! It's just painting the picture again where Dane is following all of the rules, and it blinds him to actually helping her. He does not give her real tactical advice, as from what I know, ever. Like, stay away from Jack Barlow. Like, No shit, Sherlock. This is another example, another comparison of how someone is really and truly helping Violet survive and Dane is falling real short. We move into the tree scene or what I'll call the tree scene, the scene where Violet's picking some berries and then a rebellion kid meetup happens below her. So 
as she's about to start climbing this tree that's going to be her like mission impossible standing ground for a second it literally says that the grass beneath which everywhere else is like about knee high but beneath the tree it says it looks like it's been trampled so I love that because it just shows like oh hey like that shows how long they've been meeting here. I, we know that obviously it's been there for two years, like or they've been meeting for two years. But I just love that little tidbit of like it looks like it's been trampled because they've been there so much. I want to add to that because Go for it. Violet knows this tree really, really well. She she has been in Biscaya since her mom was stationed there for five years now. So she has been here. She she knows the grounds extremely well. Would she not have noticed that the ground had been trampled on even six months ago? Or I guess well, a year ago? Speaking of that, how has she never run into anyone with a rebellion relic? Like in episode one, she's know. like, what's that? Literally just so surprised. And also, how has she never seen Zayden? They've been living in the same place basically for two years. I mean, I guess there's 500 people there, but that's not a lot. No, no there's 500 people in the writer's quadrant. Remember, she has been in the scribe quadrant. So I'm, I am I think that would be almost True. weird if they ran into each other very often. But as far as like just on the grounds, like she has well, then, never noticed that this ground has been trampled on in the past. To that same, I, I don't know if it's like she she notices for the first time when they're when she's describing this in first person in the scene, or if it's just like a stating of a fact, because it, it might just be stating of a fact rather than like, oh, I noticed. That also going back to me saying like, oh, she's never seen anyone with a rebellion relic. If she's been spending all of her time in the scribe quadrant, that would make sense why she's never seen Zayden and seen a rebellion relic, because all the rebellion relic kids are in writer's quadrant. That's yep. a really good point. I will I will give a lot of slack on that then. So she says, oh, I love this line. She says, slowly, carefully, quietly, I move out of the patch of moonlight to the next branch over, cloaking myself in shadow. Two things. One, is this the shadow that suddenly Zayden is like, oh, someone's in the tree? Or is this Zayden literally cloaking her? Because literally it also says, keeping myself on the opposite side of the trunk and sticking to the shadows that wrap around me. This is as she's like climbing down. So I think he's almost like cloaking her in the shadows so people don't see. That's just like. I I 100% agree with that. A, shadows notice her. And then B, he's cloaking her so that, you know, not everybody just kills her outright right then. (laughs) Imogen looking at you. (laughs) When they're talking, Violet recalls that Fen Ryerson has a sister. And then later on, Garrick says to the whole group, her mother, her meaning Violet, her mother is responsible for the capture of nearly, nearly all of our parents. Did Fen Ryerson's sister make it through? I, I didn't read it like that. I thought it was like more like nearly all of our parents, like are as in this group of two dozen of them. Now, the rebels who were executed were the re- rebel leaders. So my assumption there is that this group that is meeting, most of their parents were executed because most of their parents were highly involved in the rebellion or their parents were killed in the battle. And that yeah. was not in any way. That was how I read it. So that's fair. I, I It just stood out to me. I was like, I don't know. Rebecca, in my opinion, never writes anything without like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the fact that it was like Fen Ryerson had a sister, it was like, what, what? So it's just something to look out for. There's that one kid who's like, I want to go home. Like, can you help me with that? Is he still alive? Like, we never learn anything about oh, him. Like, he's I'm... totally not alive. <laughs> like, he's gone. He's done. I can't believe he even got this far. Who have I become? You've become ruthless. You're the Hufflepuff of the two of us. What the fuck happened to you? <laughs> okay, so this totally went over my head on the first read. I think it's supposed to, but on now my fourth read, when I'm analyzing this text, it really stood out. So it says, battle brief, a first year I recognize as softly. It's not that I can't keep up, but the information, dot, 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 she shrugs. You learn what they teach you, Zayden says to the first year, his voice taking a hard edge. Keep what you know, but recite whatever they tell you. Oh. So like keep what you know. So what they know is probably a whole lot more about these raids. I think that during the battle brief, when Zayden was asking that question, he wasn't asking to to ask. He was no, he asking knew. as confirmation. He And in fact, when Professor is like, we don't know what they're looking for, Zayden knows. Or if he doesn't know right this moment, then he's about to know within the next few months for sure. But I think yeah. he does know. And that also begs the question of, rebellion kids they they know that their parents fought essentially for the good side they are all keeping their heads down to survive right now 
and to survive and to continue thriving in their own rebellion, yeah. right? Like I wouldn't call it necessarily rebellion yet, but it, it it's very undercover. It like totally went over my head first read. I love lines like that. Yeah. I have some speculation on this. So Imogen says, yeah, Zayden, when do we finally get to have our revenge? And he says later, I told you already, the youngest Soren Gale is mine. Yeah, she is. And I'll handle her when the time is right. Yeah, you will. <laughs> now, that's not the reason I wanted to bring this up. The reason is because it feels to me like Imogen got in some major trouble for trying to kill Brennan's little sister on the mat. Garrick is definitely standing up for Violet in this whole scene. Zayden's not outrightly, but he's basically just saying, shut up. She's like, I'll take care of her. By the way, this is right after a kid is like, when do we get to kill Violet Sorengale? And I feel like Imogen just like looks over at Zayden. She's like, yeah, Zayden, when do we get to have our revenge? Like reminding him like she, like she, Violet, is not on our side. Belle underscore BB on Archive of Your Own has an incredible Zayn and POV written, and it includes a a really beautiful scene of Zayden, Imogen, and Garrick all having it out after Imogen almost rips Violet's arm off, basically. Oh. So I love that that's included because it's like now that's just canon in my head that like she got in major trouble for trying to kill Violet. She no, she did, though. We we learned later on that she got, like, kitchen or cleanup duty. Well, that's from Dane. But I think she got in trouble from Zayden. Oh, yeah. I just love that little inclusion. And we'll include Zayden's POV, that, in the show notes as well. So all the rebellion kids leave, and Zayden and Violet have a moment. He says, you look all frail and breakable, but you really are a violent little thing, are you? I wanted to pull this because someone asked Rebecca Yaros, how did you come up with the name Violet? And she's like... I didn't come up with the name Violet. I came up with the nickname Violence. And then Violet worked best. So I love that. It's not only the first mention of Violence, but it is also just that little tidbit of like, that's that's how she came up with the Violet name. So then we're back at class, everybody. I love, I, okay, I just love class. Are um, you sure you're not a Ravenclaw? Are you it's sure? My secondary, yes. That makes sense. <laughs> Professor Kaori's class, we are going to do an entire archive section next episode about dragons, their different types and tails, colors, etc. So we will save all of the dragon talk for then. I love how her friend and squadmate Orly is tapping her quill against the edge of her desk, and Violet notes that she can't sit still for, for a second. This is a little nod I think that she has ADHD yeah and it really does explain why her friend and squad mate is so excited for the gauntlet we'll get to this part in a little while but oh my gosh she's so excited she's been training for it forever she's meant to do obstacle courses she's meant to play and run she's not meant to sit in a classroom I bet that's the case for a lot of these writers right just like my son yes he can't sit still either <laughs> I do think it's interesting that when they're describing Segal in Professor Kaori's class, they use the word ruthless, which is the same word used for Zayden multiple, multiple, multiple times over this group. Now, it does say, nor does she abide by what we assume to be what the dragons consider law. She even bonded the relative of one of her previous writers, which you know is typically forbidden. But Segal does whatever she wants whenever she wants. I love that Sigail is like, what a girl wants, <laughs> what a girl needs. <laughs> That's just Sigail's theme song. But what do you make of this? The part that she's bonded a relative of one of her previous writers, that is not a toss away line. I don't think that it is anybody that we would have met. It obviously, I, I don't believe that it was his dad. No. Although that would be crazy, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that again, it goes to show that there is something so much bigger here that any of us know why Segal chose Zayden, why Zayden and Violet had this bond even before the dragons, what we were talking about earlier with the prickles on her neck and whatnot. I think that this, it just all rolls up into something that mm -hmm. we just don't know yet. <laughs> well, and I think it also is such a reflection of Zayden because it's like Segal does whatever she wants whenever she wants. Zayden does whatever he wants whenever he wants. Like, so I think it's just such a beautiful nod. But I agree, the bonding of a relative, that is not a throwaway line. Like, that's definitely something to look out for. So when you hear that there's a black dragon, immediately, I was like, that's going to be Violet's dragon. Yep, Boom, yep. like right there. <laughs> Although it did get thrown off by how many times there's a mention of feather tails and the golden dragon during presentation. Like, all the, like, standout dragons, I was like, that's going to be Violet's dragon. Dragon. But then it kept going back to like, oh, crap, but the big black dragon, we don't know. So 
especially though because Jack was like I want that one the second he was like that I was like "Mm, this is gonna be Violet's Dragon yes absolutely in fact I remember I was texting you so Nicole had already read Fourth Wing and I was reading it for the first time and and I live text her absolutely like you you should see the Akatar screenshots but we'll we'll share those at some point but I was texting you at this point and I was like oh she's definitely gonna get the Black Dragon like there was no question about it but then fast forward to presentation day I was like oh my gosh for sure it's gonna be the Golden Dragon and it it never once crossed my mind that it was going to be both dragons. Yeah. Big same. It like the second and Darna speaks into Violet's mind and is like, and Darna Urum, like, and Taryn's like, right, like, make her write it down. Like, come on, you know? I was like, oh, you know, like that was something I did not see coming. So Professor Kaori mentions the only way you'd ever be near him, him being Taryn, is if you're in the veil, which you won't be because you'd be incinerated before you ever got through the gorge. The pale redhead across the circle from me shifts in her seat and tugs her sleeve down to cover her rebellion relic. What does this mean? I don't know. But you know what this did just make me think of? The what did Iron Flames excerpt where Eric goes and protects a redhead. Now, I know there's more than one redhead. There there was there's more than there can only be one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel silly for saying that, but that is a very good point just about tugging her sleeve down to cover her rebellion relic. Yeah. When I first read it, it was like, oh, like it's just somebody being self conscious about it, understandably. But why would that have anything to do with the veil and being incarcerated before they ever got there? Like, what if the marked ones have been able to go to the veil? That's where I'm at. So because the marked ones are already so in fuck you, Navar, like you're not you're not paying attention to what's happening outside the wards. I think the marked ones have already been to the veil possibly even regularly. So this is back to the the big question about Dane and touching Violet, even just on the temples. Like, how is, does he not know all these other things about Andarna, about Zayden, about, you know, all of these other very important things? He got, like, some information, but not all of it. What if the dragon's magic at least protects for him from being able to see anything regarding them? For instance, Andarna and her being a baby and her powers and all of that stuff that's a big secret what if dane is not able to see that because of the dragon's magic preventing that there's that (laughs) loophole here i think that's that's going to be the little nugget of information that makes a lot more of this make sense that he's not able to see some very crucial information that that is canon in my head i love that so at the sparring challenges, like when the sparring challenges begin, Vi- Jack's just giving Violet a hard time. Shocking. But Violet throws two daggers at Jack and one nicks his ear and another is and another is an inch beneath his balls. Does that mean he's either sitting down like on a bleacher and it's like an inch beneath his balls there? Or did he she like get his leg? I'm assuming bleachers. I assumed sort. it as him like just kind of standing like guys stand sometimes and she's throwing and it just like hit in between let's just note this is one of the first times that she listens to Zayden and takes his advice over Dane's and more notably Mira's speaking of Dane he doesn't congratulate Violet after winning the fight against Orin which you motherfucker like he literally is just like I gotta get someone to clean this up like meaning the vomit and I was like you shit Dane I hate this well it's him like trying to like act all tough and whatnot and it's just again that goes back to he is too scared for her sake, for his own sake, Ridiculous. but for his sake, that he can't even see any of the positives that she's making happen, which she points out to him on many occasions. So in the scene, it's mentioned that Rayma was supposed to be Violet's sparring challenger that day, but Rayma was sent to the healers early because she couldn't walk in a straight line. In the POV, it has Zayden obviously knowing that Violet is poisoning her, her challengers and he literally takes Rayma to the healers or literally is just like hey someone should go get this girl to the healers so that he can call Violet out on it and spar I don't know if that's canon but it's kind of canon in my head like Zayden was the little like orchestrator of all of this behind the scenes where he sent Rayma to the healers so that he could spar with her but wouldn't she have to go to the healers no matter what so he, you think he was just the one who escorted her there to make sure I think, she got there or I think he was being his Zayden observant way or watching having the shadows watch for someone who is going to start acting weird that because he doesn't know who she's sparring with unless he cast his shadows into the place I where see all the knowing. sign 
I he he would know somehow. Like he he literally has said like I know everything that goes on in this school. Like he knew about Dane Signet, all that kind of stuff. So I could see him knowing Rayma was going to be her partner. So he could have been on the lookout for her starting to act weird and immediately have someone send her to the because I don't think they would escort anyone to the. I was going to say I think that's stretching <laughs> no. it a little bit there. No, like, I think he would have already... been like Garrick or Bodie, like go do it. Like I guess so. Yeah, it was it was the time. I, I thought of it as like just the timing, and she it was a very like natural thing that happened and he sees his opportunity but I I could also see him have been orchestrating that in the background so that was just something that stood out to me now sparring with Zayden this delicious scene I want to give major props to Rebecca for writing the scene because describing fighting scenes I'm not a writer but I can only imagine how difficult it is to write a battle or a sparring scene, like something where it's constantly like his arm was up here, then and then he flips me over here. Like you have to know exactly what you're doing. And I'm follow like I'm following every minute of it. And she also adds humor and flirty banter. I just love that she was doing that. There's this one line that I couldn't include in favorite moments. It was too good. I had to include it in insight. Violet says, you're not attracted, talking to herself, you're not attracted to toxic men. What a nod this is to us, like, readers, and especially smut readers. I love this. I thought that once in my life there, too, Violet. (laughs) Who hasn't? He also says, I've known better poison masters. Is he talking about Brennan or someone else in Arisha? Oh, I think he's definitely talking about Brennan. That's that's kind of what I got. That that was my understanding, yeah, is that Brennan is in his own way a potion master i think that violet her because she brought the book of poisons with her not potions master poisons master my head is always in harry potter i apologize and and she brings this book of poisons with her that mira like essentially approves of for her because it's to severely wound them so that she has an upper leg there and so i think that she gets this idea of poisons and whatnot from her brother brennan so i I think that there's definitely a connection there so after she spars with zayden she's all sore you know and she's getting massaged by Dane but it's described as she's topless from the waist up except for a bandage around her like breasts I'm assuming yeah. like you know Mulan style marks. yeah Mulan style That's, but I have a question for you how many times has your friend ever massaged you topless a friend of the opposite sex you are straight how many times has a friend of an opposite sex massaged you topless my count is absolutely zero of both sexes mine is not zero <laughs> it's like at least at two so it's a nice I'm thing that so her friend is about doing <laughs> I don't so know. much about you on this podcast I'm not gonna pry into that too much <laughs> So there's a moment where Violet reaches up to grab Dane's face and cups it. And I love that this was included to see like, hey, like, hey, this goes both ways. Yes. And I even did a search in the ebook version uh, for the word cup. And she and Zayden actually use it with one another on multiple occasions as well. So So is this just like a thing in Navarre? Like people are just like all the time? I don't know. What? (laughs) What's boundaries? <laughs> when Dane is trying, the whole thing with Amber is going down and he is demanding to see Violet's memories. The wording is something along the lines of, he reached out like he was trying to cup my face. And that wording right there is why I think the word cup her face or something to that that very specific language is is when it happens every time and then it's just to throw us off that it's also being mentioned with other people too so that's that's my two cents and that's another supporting reason why I think that it's not just skin to skin like a lot of people including you think I think that it really does have to be on the temple on the face now to be fair one of our followers on TikTok had a really good point and they said again I'm sorry I'm not citing your name we'll be better about this we promise but someone on TikTok had mentioned like because he is not as strong at the beginning of the year he even says it that he's not even adept at it yet but like what if he's using Violet as practice yeah throughout the year to practice touching other parts of the body wink to read memories that way so I do wonder if that's a thing but I could all like their cup her face is a very specific wording so I will give you that for sure but I could see him throughout the year having gained the ability to get it more and more let's move on to an American Ninja Warrior but or Siri at Kier Morin that's also what I thought right like see. that is what I think of but it's like that times 10 I love this scene because we're starting to get the squad and to know the different dynamics this is when we finally start recognizing like 
Riddick by name and stuff like that. Because we've always known Rihanna and she was there from the beginning. But we start to get a little bit more insight on Luca and Tynan, who are the most annoying people in the fucking world. And I'm so glad they get off to her. Who is this book turning me into also? But Violet is telling Riddick to like stop ta- taunting Tynan back. Not taunting Tynan, but taunting him back. And I think that this is notable. She's kind of the the person who's like, hey, like we need to start acting like a squad in this moment. So I looked up visuals of the gauntlet and it literally only came up with American Ninja Warrior. And I think that's notable because there's actually two sections of, of a 2014 American Ninja Warrior course that is literally a chimney. It's like the chimney thing where she has to like X scooch her way through and a 90 degree vertical ramp that people had to climb up and, and get. So so I think that honestly, she Rebecca Yarnos might have taken some inspiration from the chimney and the vertical ramp part because those are two very prominent parts of that course. And you say I go down rabbit holes. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> and so then uh, just I, I know I keep repeating this. The leadership and again, just the writer's quadrant culture make it so competitive to get the best times, which obviously fuels more deaths. And there's just no reason for it. Like, all that really matters is that they survive. But they try to put this extra pressure on these cadets to to be the best, to, to make it very competitive amongst themselves. I, again, it's to weed people out. But that's one thing where it's like, really, guys? Like, why? Yeah. Why? You don't need to do that. I, I'm going to keep defending that there's good, like, I think it's good world building with just really t- just – beating it into us like hey this is how things are and we understand that very clearly and this is again just another nod to that okay so I don't know about you but when I first read the gauntlet scene I was like what like it took me until this reread to actually understand it and that's because I literally went through and make notes but do you want to take us through the entire five ascents of the gauntlet I do we're gonna have a little mini archive section here the gauntlet there are five ascents each of these ascents are designed to mimic strengths and skills required to ride a dragon so some of them are about timing some of them are balance some of them are about speed and agility all of this is what each of these ascents are supposed to represent yeah so the first ascent it is a 15 foot log which spins parallel with the cliff face there are raised pillars with about three feet in between them so you have to jump and then there's the rotating wheel that you have to jump through the lone opening and so there's the first ascent one out of five and then the second ascent don't worry guys there's only one thing you got to do but it's giant hanging balls (laughs) this is sorry and then that's where the ground drops out. So if you don't like grab onto them and then jump to back to safety, boom, you plummet to your death here. This is going to be a theme throughout this gauntlet. And now we get to the third ascent. Now we have giant metal rods hanging parallel to the cliff wall where you have to swing arm over arm. And then there's shaking pillars. I, I, you guys can't see me. I'm like literally like miming all of this out here. <laughs> Watch on YouTube. And then there's the fourth ascent. So these are the spinning logs, which are twisting in opposite directions while you have to climb them like stairs. So this is one of the steepest sections of the course. And you have to basically just like, don't stop, just sprint right across it. And you have to make sure it's good timing. The whole thing is all about timing. So finally, we are at the fifth ascent, you all. We are almost there. Let's not die. Oh, but there is the chimney formation. And that is where you have to hop through it, hop up it, right? It's like up it. Yeah, it's like up it. Yeah, in an X formation, which I just like... I can't stop laughing at the image there in my head. I, I'm going to have to American go back. Ninja I was just going to say, I'm going like, to have to go and look that up on YouTube here now. <laughs> Add it into the show notes, please. Okay. Last but not least, to get to the very top, you're almost there. You have to go up a massive 90 degree ramp that then reaches the top of the cliff's edge. So you have to like do a full running sprint. And then right when you're about to not make it, then you got to like really like fling yourself up and, and get up there unless you use a dagger. All right, Lexi, how far would you make it? Which ascent would you get to? We already talked about I'm not, I, I've already died at the parapet. <laughs> For, for shits and giggles here. I mean, the first one, right? Like, I just, like, I... It's such low hopes in yourself. That's supposed to be the easy section. Okay, really, though, like, it would probably be the second one. 
the and giant not because balls. <laughs> and not because I'm a child and couldn't stop laughing. I, I would not be able to do that kind of move. I am not very agile. I, however, have more faith in myself. I would say the third ascent. However, I have gigantic hands. So I actually, like, I really do. I, I don't know if, like, like something mutated in me as I played piano as a kid. That would use it to the advantage. So and I think I could sprint up the logs. I think I have too much faith in myself. I think that's what this is. I do think I could make it to the chimney, but I would definitely, I'm five foot four. Like, I don't think I'd be able to exit out on the chimney. I definitely wouldn't be able to make it up the 90 degree ramp. I vote we create an obstacle course at the I playground outside of your apartment and film it and see which of us get further. And that can be our gauntlet. I'm so here for this. So. The last scene that we're going to talk about here in this stretch of chapters is the right way isn't the only way. The hopeless romantic is entering the chat. <sighs> Zayden says, killing you wouldn't be any trouble violence. It's leaving you alive that seems to cause the majority of my trouble. And he's doing this while he's holding her wrist and brushing against her pulse. This is the enemies to lover shit that I gobble up like turkey on thanksgiving i love it it also says shadows wrap around me and i swear i feel a caress along the side of my wounded cheek oh that was pretty sweet that that was cute cute. again this is a perceived enemies to lovers i don't think they he was ever her enemy where it's like "Eh, i was always on your team i'm just gonna handle you the who that's very ambiguous you know caress the shadows are caressing yeah come on like the, like pulse like brushing your pulse like I need to stuff. know more about this I need to know more about this in the next book God, the why the but like I do wonder if we're gonna get an alternate point of view of like going back and forth between Zayden and Violet or if it's just gonna stick in Violet's point of view I hope it does stick just in Violet's point of view and we get like one-off chapter like we did in fourth wing yeah. as long as there's not that same narrator I already know it is it is Teddy Hamilton it's the <sighs> same one yeah. Ooh, sorry, Teddy. Here's a, here's the this. deal. He's a great, he's great at narrating, but he makes Zayden sound like he's 45. And I'm like, yeah. can we not? He, Cause he also narrates a book called Honey, Hunting Adelaide, 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 something like that. I haven't read it yet, but it's definitely on my list of books to read. And apparently he does an exceptional job in that book. So I do think he just All made right, Zayden Teddy. sound way too old. We'll give you some slack here, Teddy. On that note about being Zayden's point of view, remember, Rebecca did give an interview where she specifically said, the, we're not ready yet to see Zayden's full point of view. Like, yeah, we did get that one chapter because there was a, it was very isolated, I'll say, thought yeah. process. But he is still hiding way too much and he's lying too much. That is what Rebecca Yaros said. Maybe not quote, quote, paraphrasing. I don't think we're going to get him as often as you might think in Iron Flame because he still has too many secrets. God, that quote makes me nervous. It is time for my new favorite section of the podcast, which is God fucking damn it, Dane. This is where we look at all of the moments in this stretch of chapters that Dane cups Violet's face. We're not looking at all the times he touches her, just the times he touches her face, which is two times in this section. So after the tree scene, it's a few mornings after, he's walking her to breakfast duty. And as Violet is thinking about the secret she's keeping from Dane about Zayden and the whole gathering and everything, it says, I've never, this is her thinking to herself, I've never kept a secret from Dane in my life. Then he says, Violet, did you hear me? Dane asks, lifting a hand to cradle my face. God damn it, Dane. So, so do you think that he was reading her mind in that 100%. moment? 100%. Because later- don't. No, but here's why I do think so. Because okay. literally in the next time that we see Dane in this stretch of chapters, it's the sparring challenges. And- he is described as glaring daggers at Zayden, even though he's talking to Violet about orally because he saw Zayden's memories about, or because he saw Violet's memories about the club. That is okay. too, that, that, that is, is a very good point. I am going to respectfully counter it because that's what we do here. I think that Dane is always staring daggers at Zayden. And so that is not necessarily meaning one thing or another. And I think that he is way too much of a rule follower to let that slip. Or I think that's when he starts working with his dad to like. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Because there are moments where she's like, Dane is glaring at Zayden. But I think that it's so notable that he's glaring at Zayden, even though he's literally speaking to Violet about a different person. That to me is the distinguisher there. Okay. Okay. I You just convinced me that. Of that. <gasps> yes. Point. So the second time that he touches Violet's face is 
in the massage scene, I refuse to call it anything else, Dane cradles her cheek when she's pissed off at him again for not believing in her abilities to be a writer. This is right after they begin talking about threshing and he a- he asks, do you know what happens? And then he just mansplains to her God. for like half a page. And right before that, they were discussing Zayden taking her to the mat. Was he trying to see what Zayden whispered to her while they were on the mat together? Because it literally says in that section when they're on the mat sparring, Zayden gets close to her and he literally whispers and it said... This is just for me. He's not wanting anyone else to hear. So Dane is staring at them. Like he would definitely oh, yeah. have seen. Oh, yeah. So I think he's cupping her face in this moment to see what Zayden whispered to her on the mat. You are so good at these sections. <laughs> <laughs> I love this shit. Yes, yes. I, I, I wholeheartedly so, agree with you. That it's like, oh, like Dane, let's assume that we are correct. You are correct. And that he now knows what Zayden said, which is, you know, nothing crazy. It's just instructing her. Maybe it's like, oh, everybody else is instructing her. Maybe I should too. No, Mm -mm. no, no, no. 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 In fact, is that right after, is it right after he cups her face that then he launches into that she needs to leave, that he found a way out for her in the scribes, or did he tell that to her beforehand? That was beforehand, because that's when she's she's still laying down. Got it. And then he starts talking about that, and she she ships up to, like, listen to him, that's and right. that's when yep. he cups her face. So just to close out this section, we have a Dane touching Violet count. If it is only face touching, we have two in episode one. We have two in episode two, coming to a total of four face touches by chapter 10. If it is any and all touching, we had five in episode one. We have eight total here, which comes to a total of 13. So that is our God fucking damn it, Dane section. So now we're on to foreshadowing. I already talked about quite a bit of the foreshadowing from the battle brief. So just refer back to that section. Lots of foreshadowing there. And then we have Luca and Pryor who they have some uh, some page time and just like dang I'm so glad that the dragons burned both of them. But in those like few paragraphs their characters are so just like this is exactly why they get burned. So I just thought that was some fun little foreshadowing as they show their true colors just right there on the page and they get what's coming to them. And then under this, under the tree in that scene, Violet's thinking to herself, or maybe the marked ones are plotting to burn Bez Gaeth to the ground and finish what their parents started. So <laughs> this is an entirely true sentence, even though it's said very sarcastically in the, at least in the audiobook. So yes, they do want to. To, maybe they're not plotting, but they want to burn Buzz Gaius to the ground. Zayden says something along those lines later in the book. And they are wanting to finish what their parents started, but she's missing, she meaning Violet, is missing a huge component, aka the venom. So in Professor Kaori's class, there's a section on Naolin, who is Taryn's previous writer, and it says his signet was siphling, so he could absorb powers from various sources of other dragons, other writers, and then use it and redistribute it. There are some theories that are showing that Violet's second power, because we're assuming she's going to get one from Andarna, is going to be of similar nature. However, it also mentions that there's no signet capable of resurrection. That's not necessarily true because we, th- I, I think that Naolin did, like, I think Brennan did die. And Naolin was such a powerful writer with such a powerful dragon, Tarn. He did actually resurrect him. I think he was like, a sliver from death and that is what like you know you think about like harry potter when spoilers he dies (laughs) don't worry he does come back though guys (laughs) but it's almost like they're not completely gone there's still like this tiny little glimmer right i think that that is the same case in this with brennan was essentially gone there's some kind of wording where he was too far gone to be brought back i think that he was not too far gone and that is how he was brought back but he was far enough gone that it took all of naolin's energy and that is how he died because it took that much power and that's how he burned out so violet says to professor kaori during their little like one-on-one after class she says thank you but being smart and compassionate isn't going to help me when it comes to threshing oh contrary it will i love that i just like the humans don't know nearly as much as they think they know about the dragons like it is really funny how how that's actually the case And I think Professor Kaori is the only person who's accepted that. (laughs) Like, I think every other professor is like, we know everything. And Professor Kaori is like, I don't know. So last thing of this foreshadowing section is someone like you would never, this is Violet to 
Zayden. Someone like you would never get it, but I knew coming here was a death sentence. Oh, there's so much, so much of him actually getting that. So now we are at the archives section and this is the part of the podcast episode where we dive super deep into a specific topic around world building characters, events, things along those lines. So we talk a lot about the rebellion and the marked ones and we learn a lot about them in this section. Let's talk about them in the archives here. First and foremost, what is the rebellion that all of this is talking about? So in order to answer that, we need to take one step back. Tirandor was the sixth and last providence in Navarre to pledge allegiance to the king at the time. Tenendor is in the southwest of the continent. It is the largest providence in Navarre. And to the west is the Emerald Sea. To the south is the Arctical Ocean. And the cliffs of Draelor are along the southern coast and they act as a protective barrier, essentially making this really one of like the safer areas. It's Location makes it difficult to to get in here. 627 years after they pledged allegiance to join Navarre, they started the Tirish Rebellion. The Tirish Rebellion ended five years ago from the start of our story. The sto the, our story occurs over one year, so there's some different times used, but it ended five years ago. And then we later learned that from Zayden, it hadn't slept well in more than six years. So we can estimate that the rebellion was just under a year. I'm going to just throw out like maybe nine months. So it wasn't a really long time, but it wasn't just completely smushed. The rebellion is referred to as the apostasy by the people of Tirandor, the rebels, and the succession by Navarian people. So that just really gives you a mind of these two very different ideologies. The Battle of Arisha and the Treaty of Arisha shut the rebellion down. Arisha was, is, the capital of Tirandor and was is the headquarters for the rebellion. After the Battle of Arisha, which happened, again, five years ago from the start of our story, and the execution of the rebellion's leaders, the city was burned to the ground. Violet says at one point that this never really sat well with her, what Navarre did to Tirandor, to Arisha for this. Let's talk about the leaders of the rebellion. Finn Ryerson, Zayden's dad, he led the rebellion. So Finn Ryerson was captured after killing... Brennan during the Battle of Arisha. He was later executed publicly along with other rebellion leaders. I'm going to go ahead and quote this because this is super key. In his last days of interrogation, Finn Ryerson lost touch with reality, railing against the kingdom of Navarre. He accused the king and all who came before him of a conspiracy so vast, so unspeakable, that it does not bear repeating by this historian. The execution was swift and merciful for a madman who cost untold lives. So that is from Navarre var and unedited history and guess what his last words were you're all cowards Whew, got chills. My guy. He was, they were right. They are the good guys because Navar are cowards because they are not willing to tackle the really big, bad dangers outside of their borders. They want to stay and live in their la-la land. And Finn Ryerson was like, no, that's not right. That is not the good thing to do. You guys are cowards. And and Navar just completely rewrote that history. Mr. I was about to say Mr. Ryerson. <laughs> Mr. Ryderson was executed by Lilith Sorengale, so Violet's mom, and that is why Zayden, his son, seemingly hates Violet, and why so many other rebellion leaders' children hate Violet. Her mom literally killed their parents. To honor the lost lives at the Battle of Arisha and those saved by the Treaty of Arisha, according to Navarre, July 1st is proclaimed as Reunification Day, so it's the anniversary of the battle. Now let's talk about who the Marked Ones are. The Marked Ones are 107 children under the age of 20 from when the battle happened of the 68 separatist officers who were executed. Now these 107 children were displaced and fostered by loyal high-ranking families after their parents were executed. The rebel family's land were given to Navarre loyalists there. Now, General Melgan's Black Dragon, Coda, marked all of these children, even one who is still in the womb, wow. And they are called rebellion relics. They're tattoos with harsh symbols and swirls and slashes. And the oldest is, of course, Zayden. He is now 23 years old, which means that he was 18 at the time when his father died. I wanted to just do a quick little note here because this stood out to me. He is the oldest, yes, but his birthday is also in March, which typically means you're of the younger year, the youngers of your year. Now, there's not a lot of third years that we can imagine, but like, does that mean that everyone else's birthdays are like April through 
June. Like, <laughs> right? That, that's a very interesting interesting note there because there are several other, other third years with him. His cousin, Bodhi uh, Garrick, you know, the youngest yeah. is almost six years old. Now, Zayden, as the oldest, made a deal with Navarre. He took personal responsibility for the loyalty of these 107 children. And in return, they're allowed to fight for their lives in the writer's quadrant instead of just being put to death like their parents. Wow. Okay, this is, I know. This is when everyone is like, oh, like there's five, there's four books left. Like, spoiler for Actar, real quick. Just jump ahead 30 seconds if you haven't read it. This is when everyone's like, oh, he's going to be the new Tamlin. He's not. Tamlin would never do this shit. Stay. I'm going to hold off on everything I want to say about that. <laughs> But yes, <laughs> stay tuned for January 2024 for Akatar. And so if, if any of these marked ones, these 107 children, as they grow up, if any of them betray Navarre, which I'm very curious to know how that is interpreted, he's dead. Like he, he took personal responsibility. So he dies if any of them do betray. Whew, that is a heavy, heavy burden to put on yeah. your shoulders, buddy. All of these children, as we've talked about, they are required to enlist in the writer's quadrant. The marked ones have varying perspectives on this deadly acquired military path. Liam, for instance, being the half full cut glass kind of guy he is, he believes that it's a path to climb the social ladder. I think that's really cool because that's yeah. clearly what's happening with Zayden. Others, quite a few others, they recognize this as punishment. It's an effort to put these children to death without you know getting the leadership's hands bloody themselves you know the navarian leadership they did not think that a dragon would bond with any of these marked ones and when they did now navar just doesn't know what to do with them like they don't know what to do with zayden and all of them i have a lot of thoughts on that too about why the dragons i wonder if the dragons are bonding with more marked ones we don't know well, that, that might yet. be why she again going back to when she pulled her sleeve down maybe okay so there are rules that do apply for the marked ones there are no more than three are allowed to be together at any time including in each squad we find out that this is because general melgan cannot see the outcome of a battle which is his signet power that he can see the outcome of battles which is very very handy but hey if there are more than three marked ones he can't see the outcome which is very very convenient for the end of our end of our story here so that's why zayden reflects that, that the rebellion relic he has is actually a gift not a curse and then last thing i'll say on this whole section especially the marked ones is just the hostilities towards these kids and you know 20 plus year olds as well you know outside of the writer's quadrant where they're pretty you know like there's definitely still some hostilities but they're there like they have to work together so people are kind of just get used to them outside of the writer's quadrant that's not how things are they are really looked down on you know liam like violet just feels so bad for liam and how he's being treated and being the amazing wonderful precious guy that he is he takes it all like a champ shouts to you liam i love you lexi that was marvelous thank you <laughs> thank you for that oh my god <laughs> okay, now it is time to close out the episode with taking flight with our favorite moments. Okay, we're going to talk about the pens just one more time here. Violet, <laughs> we won't give up on these fucking pens. I stick by my theory about the muggles. Anyway, so Violet most looks forward to channeling her future powers to use these pens that her mom uses. And I just love that she wants to use these writer powers for scribe things. Just love it. And Mira's dragon scale vest that she gives Violet in the first chapter, it comes in clutch. Like, it saves Violet's life. And I just, like, love that Emma Jean ends up being her friend i don't know like it's interesting how how that dynamic does shift but like right now you're reading it's like whew, talk about enemies my goodness i love when violet says i need to know what my chances are here and literally zayden comes back with that's the oddest way i've ever been hit on i just yeah, <laughs> i love, love that it. moment okay. so in the tree movement this is when it's just the two of them together it says his gaze locks onto the length of my braid where it falls over my shoulder and i swear he stops breathing for a heartbeat this also makes nicole stop breathing for a heartbeat i love lines like this there's also a line that says this is from zayden again it's no fun if you expect it and i love that that's just such a little nod to us readers because there's a lot of stuff that happens in this book that we did not expect i also just love that they describe taryn as a middle-aged like man he's just a middle-aged grumpy man <laughs> In, in in their dragon class like again it's just i did not expect his personality to be what it was it kind of reminds yeah. me of that fairly new disney movie about the dragons and like the dragon personalities in that movie were very very jarring i won't say jarring in this instant but it was surprising and it was just i, I just love him so much just oh shall i get the wing leader oh, yeah gosh. i'm gonna just need a whole section to talk about that line because i love, I it love so that line favorite lines from sparring with 
Satan was Violet is he's on top of her and he's like you know yeah he is <laughs> don't make my heart stop beating <laughs> and it literally says refusing to think about other things that are a good fit from this <laughs> angle I know Violet needs to get laid. Violet really needs to get laid. And she knows it. And yes. I love it for her. I love it. Or at least get like a really heavy duty vibrator. Like, is there a bus guy? It's like, she like, needs can to talk she get to Nesta. Something? Get some <laughs> smut in this girl's hands. So the last thing I want to say is that I love that there's a couple that can't decide if they're going to make out or not. But then they end up just like going at it in the courtyard. The amount of times I saw this shit in college, I can't even tell you. The amount of times I was that shit in college, I can't even tell you. All right, friends, that is it. That's all we've got for episode two. If you are not already, please be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. We love getting tagged. Talk to us in the comment section. Give it, shoot us your DMs. We have been completely overwhelmed. So if we're taking a little while to reply, it's nothing personal. We promise. We just we just need to see our husbands. (laughs) Like Like, we need to see our husbands every once in a while. So and and thank you so much for all of that. Keep it coming. We we really do love it. And then also email us your thoughts. I think we had another one come in just a yes, we did. recording today. Email us at fantasyfangirlspod at gmail.com to get, share your thoughts on what we covered in the episode. Any, you know, which part of the gauntlet would you die on too? We want to hear. Ooh, yeah, tell us which part of the gauntlet. Also, rate and review the show. We have been getting so many amazing ratings and reviews through Apple and Spotify. You guys keep them coming because it really helps other people find the show. We found and it makes we Nicole were- cry. Nicole like cries. <laughs> Like, I read the Apple reviews this morning and I screenshotted them to Lexi and I was like a weeping mess. And it was like 6.30. It always happens at 6.30. I'm always crying at 6.30 for this thing. <laughs> Please keep those coming. It really is super helpful. We found out that we were ranked number 12 on the arts category for Spotify podcast this morning. That is insane. Please keep those coming. It is so helpful. And the most helpful of all, share this with your fellow fourth wing buddies. The amount of DMs we've gotten from people saying, I shared this with our friends. I shared this with my book club. Like yes. keep those going. That is so awesome. I will say one thing here before we completely sign off. My husband's cousin was sharing our <laughs> podcast, not knowing it was me. And when I posted it to my personal Instagram stories, she like, like screaming a, a voice memo and it's like, oh my God, I did not know that this was you. <laughs> it's so much fun. She's visiting in a few weeks and I'm just so excited. Y'all, thank you so much for being with us here today. We will talk to you in episode three. Bye. Bye.